My name is Julie Sanders. I'm Deputy Vice-Chancellor here at Newcastle University, and it gives me the greatest pleasure to welcome everyone, distinguished panelists, members of the audience, to Newcastle University, which is proud to be one of the two lead partners, together with the Community Foundation for Tyne and Weir in Northumberland, of this amazing generosity festival taking place across the Northeast this month and gathering pace, energy and ideas as it goes, I think. The festival is a celebration of philanthropy, of voluntary giving for the public good, of going the extra mile, not out of self-interest, but in the interest of society. And the extensive research now published on the festival website by colleagues here at the University reveals just how important philanthropy has been at various stages in history in helping to drive beneficial social change here in the Northeast and across Britain, leading the way in vitally important fields such as welfare, provision, education, health, and progressive movements for social reform such as the abolition of slavery and women's rights. This symposium is one of the festival headline events being held here at Newcastle University, and we're very fortunate indeed to have such an exceptionally accomplished group of panel members, people who have had a major impact in the worlds of business and philanthropy. Now more than ever, as the state struggles to keep pace with the many demands placed upon it, we need people of goodwill, people who take pride in their society and its contribution to the wider world, to join forces in the great national drive for social renewal. And here at Newcastle, we've placed this imperative at the heart of our newly launched university strategy. And it is, of course, the theme of this symposium, transformational philanthropy in action. So I'm very much looking forward to what our panelists have to say about their own projects and ideas and to the discussion of the issues that arise from them. I'm actually a researcher in 17th century literature and culture, so I couldn't resist sharing with you a couple of quotations on this occasion from the great polymath, Sir Francis Bacon, who wrote on philanthropy. Bacon, as many of you will be aware, was a fine essayist as well as a politician and a scientist. And in his essay of good and goodness of nature, he declared, I take goodness in this sense, the affecting of the wheel of men he was writing in the 17th century, which is that the Grecians call philanthropia. And the word humanity, as it is used, is a little too light to express it. Goodness I call the habit, and goodness of nature the inclination. And he goes on in a very beautifully crafted, typically short and pithy Baconian essay to unpack the inclination to giving with real insight. But I just wanted to end with a tiny section towards the close of the essay, which I think... This afternoon of all afternoons actually gives me pause for thought. The parts and signs of goodness, he says, are many. If a man be gracious and courteous to strangers, it shows he is a citizen of the world and that his heart is no island cut off from other lands, but a continent which joins them. I think we're probably all working out what it means to be citizens of the world right now, and I know we will hear some provocations around that this afternoon. And I think the role that philanthropy can play in that is very important and very real, and as the title of this symposium indicates, transformational. So I am going to leave you with that very small contribution on my part to the afternoon's serious work. But it is my absolute pleasure to hand over the reins to the symposium chair, Professor Murray McLean of the School of Management at the University of Bath. But Murray, prior to taking up her present post, was research director here in the business school at Newcastle University. She remains a leading member of our Centre for Research on Enterprise, Wealth and Philanthropy. And it is my great delight to welcome her, to welcome her back here today. So Murray, over to you. Thank you very much, Julie. Thank you. I just want to say a few words about transformational philanthropy. What is transformational philanthropy? First of all, there are four key characteristics to bear in mind when you're listening to the presentations. And the first of these is the theory of change. How the philanthropists intend to make an impact, a lasting impact, how they believe it will work, and they're going to tell us about their vision for transformational philanthropy in a theory of change. Um, the important aspect of this is that it must be sustainable. 
Giving for the here and now is important and all very well, but we've just been doing some research on the 900 years history of philanthropy in the Northeast area. And what we've discovered is that gifts that were made centuries ago are still having an enduring impact in the here and now in communities in the Northeast today. So the sustainability and the lasting nature of transformational philanthropy is so fundamental. We're in buildings at the moment that have been legated by philanthropists, visionaries of the past who wanted to give to the future and we're all the beneficiaries of those. Um, another aspect is the partnership working. It is very difficult for a single philanthropist to do everything on their own. They have to engage with others with partners who could be philanthropists, who could be government, who could be authorities, different kinds of organisation in order to make impact that is durable and will last. And the other aspect of transformational philanthropy is the scaling up. It's great to start small. I believe in starting small, but it's great also to scale up so that there are more beneficiaries from the acts of transformational philanthropy. Now we're very privileged to have four illustrious speakers today and they're all first among equals. So they're going to be presenting in alphabetical order. <laughs> and I'd like to hand over now to Bill Holroyd, CBE, who's founder and chair of Onside Youth Zones. We look forward to hearing about that, Bill. So uh, this, this is me and uh, I am going to be talking about a charity that I founded in 2008 called Onside Youth Zones. Um, but first of all, uh, a little bit of uh, background as to uh, how, I, how I came to this situation. It doesn't start very well. I was expelled from school for being disruptive. My mother supported me massively in that, uh, in that decision. She thought I could do better being disruptive outside of school. So it was great. Uh, I went on to have uh, a pretty good business career, actually, because uh, disruption in business can be seen as a good thing. So some lucky, I was a lucky person. That one person channeled my disruptiveness into something positive and made me think, why not? You know, uh, why, why do you have to abide by the rules? Why can't you just do it different? And it turned out that was a really good thing to do in, if I was channeled in the right direction. And I built up this business. Um, I sold it to Booker. Uh, all of my friends had told me, you are one dimensional, Bill. All you do is work. You get up in the morning. You're not married, no kids. You get up in the morning, you go to work. You come home in the evening, you go to bed, stick something into the microwave, open a bottle of wine, go to bed. That was it. And so all the time they've been nagging at me about this. So I sell the business, I get married, I buy the big house, you know, do all the stuff. And uh, I'm indulging myself in my hobbies, I'm indulging myself in my family, and I'm indulging myself in my business. So why aren't I feeling like all of my friends told me I would feel, which would be wonderful. I'm a totally balanced individual. I'm a three-dimensional individual at last. Well, I'm not, and it really bugs me. I'm going around, I'm thinking, is it religion? Have I missed out on religion? Is that the, is that the missing dimension? And I went into that, and I'm, I'm proud to say I'm still very heavily involved in religion. But it wasn't that. That wasn't the bit that was missing. There was something missing. And then a guy called Ross Warburton, scion of the Warburton's bread empire, phoned me up with the least attractive job offer you are ever going to receive, to be the chairman of the Bolton Lads and Girls Club, right? We all know what youth clubs are like. And this is not an attractive offer. For some reason, my subconscious, I've been really good at saying no, said yes immediately. I love to do that. I love to do that. Let me do it. I don't come from Bolton. I've never worked from kids, never worked in the charity side at all. <laughs> so I was perfect for the job. <laughs> and so I said yes. And I went along to see this incredible, amazing institution, the Bolton Lads and Girls Club, which the good folk of Bolton have built a proper place where children could go in their leisure time. Now, I didn't know there was a problem until I saw the answer. And 
when you see all these kids, and there'd be about 200 a night in this uh, wonderful club. There'd be about 200 in there. And these are all the scary kids, the ones you pass the street rather than, if you see a group of about 10 of them, you just go the other side of the street because they're scary. And there they all are. There's black kids, Muslim kids, disabled kids, you know, white kids, you know, the whole lot just mixing there, having a great time. And it's only then that I, I fully understood what the problem was. And the problem was that we used to do youth clubs really well. It used to be a good place to go. You know, if you close your eyes now and think about a youth club today, though, you're all thinking the same thing. I promise you, you could draw it now. It's a rubbish premises. It's got a leaky roof. There's only a few kids in it, and they're playing ping pong. That is it. Every time I say it, I get that response by it. We haven't got time to go through the audience tonight, today. And where do kids go? They have nowhere to go. And I suddenly saw the problem. Youth clubs have gone for all practical purposes. Kids have nowhere to go. They have nothing to do in their leisure time of any standard. On top of that, they get criminalized because they have nowhere to go and nothing to do. I'd love to meet the guy who invented the ASBO. Fantastic, what a great job. Absolutely isolating someone and marking him out as a total failure and someone who society hates. You know, well done. Absolutely. They get marginalized and ghettoized. And you know, those, those are the tough kids. They're the ones with the real hard luck stories. But the other kids are on their mobile phone. They're doing social media. They're living in this false world where everything's bloody wonderful apart from your life. I've never seen any of my kids put a rotten picture up on social media. And it, you know, you talk about depression. You know, these, these, and kids sitting in their bedroom because they've got nowhere safe to go, just playing on the computer. You know, so it's, it's all kids have nowhere to go, nothing to do. And the unfair advantage is kids at private schools or kids at boarding schools because they've got loads to do and they're not allowed to go on their phones and all that stuff. They're not allowed to be on that. And they learn a lot of things. But that's where they get the job. The education system is pretty rubbish in the, uh, in the private schools. Sorry if anyone's here from private schools. But it's just the same. A couple of my kids went to them. It's just the same. The education's the same. But it's everything else that is different. And that means when they go for an interview, they can speak. They can communicate. They've got something interesting in their life. They've been taught all these things by osmosis. So. I decided that the Bolton Lads and Girls Club was so good that it had to be replicated so that every, every child would have a safe and inspiring place to go in their leisure time. I'm just going to show you a quick video which will explain it. I've witnessed our young people float around with an energy dispersed into the oblivion of nowhere to go and nothing to do. Aimless in the endless maze of boredom, loneliness and temptation. There seems to be no way out for this lost generation, left to spend 85% of waking hours outside of education with no fire to illuminate that boundless imagination. And we wonder why one in eight from low-income estates achieves average earnings as an adult. It's an insult. A social crisis, a growing virus, the likes of which we have never seen. But there is a way out. A silver lining to the dark cloud. If you are aged 8 to 19, or up to 25 with a disability, Onside is opening its doors to a brighter future. Somewhere fun, safe, and inspiring to go. Something exciting to do, a hot meal with those you know. Someone to talk to for guidance or support into your choice of employment. Someone who listens, understands, 
and believes in your empowerment. From state-of-the-art sports, media, dance and musical facilities to inclusive activities for young people of all ability. <laughs> From arts and crafts to enterprising career paths to just meeting some friends and having some laughs. <laughs> Giving a generation the chance and the confidence, the determination to find themselves without discrimination. Giving a generation the hunger and the drive to lead healthy, active and aspirational lives. There are well over 20,000 young people engaged in over 20 activities a day here, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, and one in four come for one-to-one -one support. It's proven to reduce crime and antisocial behavior by half or more, as well as create hundreds of opportunities for employment. It's 21st century youth provision built on noble and sustainable partnerships between the community, local authority, young people, and private business leadership. Without each other, none of this would happen. So let's support each other and make it happen. Help Onside create 100 youth zones and give young people a way out. Out. Thank you. So um, that is what, that was the sort of facility we wanted to create, uh, or I particularly wanted to create, and I built a team around me, and we started getting support for it. And we worked out what made the Bolton Lads and Girls Club so special, because that's all we wanted to do, replicate it, and make sure every town had one. Uh, and so, what, what, what kind of makes it work? What, what's the pixie dust in making a youth zone or a youth, big youth club working? Well, it, it, it's not hit and miss. This, is, this requires a lot of thought because you can get this wrong so easily. It starts with the building, just a, a great place to go. It attracts the kids. And why shouldn't a premises be as good as adults would go in? I get criticised for producing you know, wonderful buildings. They say, that's good enough for adults to go in. I mean, how bad is that? How bad is that? These are the kids, we can change their lives. Can't change my life. Can't change a lot of the audience in here life. But when you get them when they're eight, or younger even, you can really change their lives just by inspiration, by osmosis, not by ramming it home to them. It's got to be the best of everything, not the worst. No hand-me-down. It's got to be the best, or else we don't do it. It's got to be open when it's needed. Youth clubs don't open at weekends. That's bonkers. Bonkers. They've got to be open every night, all day at weekends, and all day during school holidays. Any time a school's uh, not open, we should be open, so that kids have wall-to-wall -wall places, safe and inspiring places to go. It's got to be in the right location. You can build a youth club where no one can get to. It's not on the bus route. It's not in the centre. It's territorial. You've got to spend a lot of time getting it in the right place. Total integration. Make sure that all of the community is represented there. All abilities, all ethnic backgrounds. And you track them to make sure that one isn't getting out of kilter with the other. You map your local demographics and you ape them in the youth club. It's really important. Running it like a business, running a charity like a business sometimes gets the odd sideways look. Well, why shouldn't you? It's more important than a business. It should be run along the efficient lines with budgetary and financial control. And there's no harm in marketing. You know, it is not a bad thing to do. Partnership, really important. We have a four-way partnership. We have uh, the private sector, the public sector, the kids themselves are thoroughly involved. They pay 50p to, uh, it's a members club for kids only, pay 50p to get in. And the volunteers, we have thousands of volunteers and we treat them like staff. They're not a, a second rate member of staff. They're better than our staff. They're giving their time for nothing. And so why wouldn't you treat them like so? You'd be surprised how many charities treat uh, their staff their volunteers rather quite badly. No training, no uniform, no scheduling. That's really important to get that right. Grow your own talent. That's something specific to Onside. We could not find people who in this day and age could run proper youth clubs. We have, to, we have our own university 
for uh, youth clubs. So we had to do that because we couldn't get the quality of people coming through. I'm sure we will eventually, but we had to set up our own education for that. And the network, now that we're building more and more of these, it's the network that's the, the power. When we all work together and we can reach so many kids and we operate as a network, instead of being grains of sand, the network makes those grains of sand into a building block, into a brick upon which we can build a fantastic network for kids, a platform for kids in the country. In fact, if Carlsberg opened youth clubs, that's what they would do. They would be like this. And why not? It's for our kids, for God's sake. You know, as I cannot hammer it home too much, we can do something about our kids, and it stops all the nasty stuff coming downstream later on in life. And it doesn't take much. So what have we achieved so far? Well, these are some of the ones we've built. They cost six or seven million each to build, so it's not an easy ask to raise that kind of money, public and private sector. So we've opened 12. We've been going 10 years. It took a long time to get anything going. Uh, we've opened 12. We've got another 10 in process at the moment. We've got 40,000 members at the moment, 2,000 volunteers, and over 100 million quid for young people in Britain raised so far. In actual fact, it's well over 100 million. The, if it's done right, people will invest in this. Um, and we've found the generosity of the great British public has been, quite frankly, astounding. Um, and the lessons learned. Think big. If you, you know, this is a big problem and we wanted to think of a big solution. We wanted to dovetail with education. We think we are part of the education. Um, they say 80% of a child's education takes place outside the classroom. It's just education with a small e. If you think of your own upbringing, those moments that changed your life, some of them would have been in the classroom. A lot of them would have been outside. The influences of your friends, the, your activities, the clubs you're in, your parents, you know, lots of other things, home life, all of that. But we, had to, we learned to think big on it. We view our members, our kids, as customers. You know, it's a business. If they're not happy, if they're not coming in, we have to change. We want our kids to come in. They vote to come in. They're not forced to come in. And we have very high standards of performance. That If we're not attracting customers, we will find ways of getting them. Understand that we're a community asset. Onside sets them up, then we gift them into the community. They don't know anything about onside. It's really important these are community assets. The four-way partnership I've discussed. Start with the local council. If they're not interested, we will not work on our own. That partnership is so important. We have walked away, as Peter knows, to our cost. We've put so much effort into the Northeast, to be specific, sadly. Um, and the councils didn't see the benefit. Uh, they've all, we've all got financial problems, the whole country has. But it's a leap of faith. And the councils are being battered. They're having their budgets more than decimated. And some of them can see this is a bet for the future that's worth taking, and sadly some can't. The network I've discussed. Measure everything. You would in a business, so we do measure everything. We measure demographics, we measure number of people coming through, we measure attitude, we measure the, the nasty stuff, like uh, youth-related crime, which goes down by an average of 50% wherever we open one. 50%, you know, it's not 0.5%. This is moving the dial across in a way that you couldn't, have, you couldn't have hoped for. Governance, you know, you'll have all heard of Kids Company. The one good thing that that charity did was to wake all charities up to governance. It is a massive thing. I sit through, it's not my natural milieu, I have to say, but um, we have tons of governance and it is really, and everybody, does it properly and subscribe to it. It's so important these days, especially, especially with young people's lives. And we accept as our network that we will not let one fail. Whatever it is, we're there to support them through their life. They, we will not let them fail, and we have not let any fail. It's really important. And that brings investment in, because people know that they're going to be there forever, because we won't let them fail. And learning that one was a big lesson for us. 
So, um, what are our ambitions? Well, there we are. Oh, go on then. <laughs> we may as well. There's no reason not to. B&Q have 350 branches in the UK, would you believe? They go where the chimney pots are. Well, why wouldn't we go there? We've got very big ones, we've got middle-sized ones, and we've got semi-skimmed ones that we can do for all communities. So, in, in wrapping up and saying thank you, I just wanted to say that I think there is a new philanthropy going on out there. I absolutely believe this. I sleepwalked into it. I didn't know. This was the last thing I expected to happen to my life. Certainly the last thing my wife expected to come into my life. Because it's been all-consuming. It's taken over. For the last 10 years, it's completely taken over my life. And what occurred to me is we used to be really good at it. The film that uh, Charles produced starts by saying, we used to be really good at this. The Victorians, this university, look around. I'm looking at all buildings that uh, were built by philanthropists. We used to do it. Then what happened? The nanny state took over and did everything for us so we don't have to do anything. And what did that do for communities? It made everyone say, these roads need repairing. Somebody should, somebody should do something about that. You know, yeah, well, well, education. Somebody should do something about that, you know. And giving the, uh, the government a, a hard time and everything. Because the governor said, we'll do everything for you. There's now a realisation that we're going back to communities saying, nobody's going to do it for us. We've got to do it for ourselves. And if we're going to make a difference, it starts in the community. And that groundswell of new philanthropy that I'm seeing, so much more volunteering, especially in communities. The village hall movement, you know, sounds very Middle England. But it, not, it works. It brings communities together. Our youth sons have shown me that. People take pride in their communities and they want to give back. And I think that's a really good thing. And I think we will get back to almost Victorian levels of philanthropy if we think in those terms. And the government stops doing everything for us. So I think that th this community, um, new philanthropy, the philanthropy that's coming through is much more efficient. I think they do it for a lot less money, a lot quicker, and a lot better. It's more rewarding, it's more engaging, and it's more relevant to the communities that's in. It's micro-philanthropy as well as mega-philanthropy. So I do see a whole wa new wave of philanthropy coming through, and that's why I was more than delighted to come here today. Thank you very much indeed. Good afternoon, and it's, uh, it's a great honor to be here, and especially with Bill and Fran and Peter, three such great uh, philanthropists. And I'm honored to be, to be amongst them and to be back at Univers University of Newcastle, which, to which I'm greatly attached. Um, the, um, I'm going to talk about ARC and about uh, schools. Uh, just as Bill has talked about himself, just to say a word, I also would consider myself and be considered a disruptor in my day job. Uh, I've, I've been in the fund management industry for 30 years. The last 20 as a hedge fund manager, which some of you may disapprove of. Um, and we are just actually one end of the fund management spectrum. Um, and but a disruptive end, and uh, the story of Ark is that, and I'm also I would, I would say, I'm also emanated by by religious faith, uh, like Bill. So the faith is an important motivator for me and why I'm in my journey. The story of Ark is that around about 2000, the year 2000, a group of uh, hedge fund managers got together and said, "Listen, guys, we are completely disproportionately." rewarded by society for what we do. Uh, it's ludicrous how much you can earn in, in the hedge fund world. We've got to give back, and we've got to steward this wealth. And we set up something called ARC, which actually stood for Absolute Return for Kids. And, uh, we, wanted, it was, and we wanted to apply some of the disciplines that we use in our, in our day jobs, including use of data, uh, management, uh, and innovation to try and make a difference in philanthropy. And we actually started 
outside this country. The first thing we did was a, a very big HIV project in South Africa before. Uh, we were the first and largest HIV project in South Africa with about 20,000 children under, under, treat, under treatment before Mbeki recognized the link between HIV and AIDS. And then we spent, then we did a lot of work in Romania and Bulgaria taking children out of orphanages uh, after the com communist regime. Um, but then in 2004, we're still on onside here, so uh, uh, there we go. Um, 2004, um, we, looked, we came to the UK and we had found it actually very difficult at first to find out how we could best use our, our money and efforts. Uh, but we've ended up uh, doing a very big uh, initiative in schools, and that's what I want to talk about. Um, and um, I want to talk about it particularly in relation to the, sub the theme of philanthropy working with the public sector. Um, and before I get onto that, I just want to deal with the first bullet point there, which is the relationship between philanthropy and problem solving. So, Many of you will know the difference in definition between charity and philanthropy. Charity comes from the Latin, uh, and it basically means the heart, caritas, uh, and it relates to giving. Philanthropy has a bigger meaning. It's obviously from the Greek, uh, but it, the, the, and, and it means love of humankind. So it's quite similar, but actually the story behind philanthropy from Aeschylus, Prometheus Unbind, was about Prometheus giving the gift of fire to humankind. Fire brings energy, heat, light, uh, and it, it basically the potential for an enormous change and innovation. So for, for me, philanthropy is a much bigger word than charity. And, I'm, and, I, and that's why I'm so glad that the emphasis today is on, is on philanthropy, because I think all of us, you'll, you'll hear, are all interested in problem solving. Uh, and it's not just giving money away, it's working out how can the money make a difference? What are the problems I can identify which I can try and solve, or we collectively as a group can try and solve um, uh, through new thinking. And that leads to the question of the relationship with the public sector. Um, now, the public sector has great strengths. Uh, it has, above all, it has universal coverage, and that's why, you know, in the 19th century, charity, the problem with charity, there were great initi initiatives, but they didn't touch everybody, and there were many people left out of the net. And the reason the public sector took over the provision of public services, the most important reason is because you, you couldn't let anybody be left out. That's the most important uh, single asset of the public sector, in my view. The second is it's obviously democratically accountable. Uh, and, and it's got, a, despite what's going on at the moment, a lot of funding. Um, the, the weaknesses are that it is risk averse. Uh, there's very little ex room for experimentation and innovation in the public sector, uh, and it tends to be bureaucratic. And therefore, there's actually a great opportunity for philanthropy to come and work together with the public sector in solving problems. What can philanthropy add? It can bring new leadership and energy uh, because you've got your people coming in who've got a particular vision, one great idea, they want to make it happen. And you find with those people an enormous passion. They don't take no for an answer. That energy, more often than not, comes from people who've created something which they really, really are attached to. It's their brainchild and so on. Secondly, it, it harnesses altruism. There's a lot of altruism in the public sector. There's a lot of altru altruism in the private sector. But the place where it's singly most concentrated is in philanthropy and charity. Because that's why you go in. You go in because you're altruistic. That is your motivation. So there's just a, a much bigger, uh, it's almost 100% altruism as being the motive of people and why they do things. Uh, and then the third one, innovation and experimentation. I wanted to refer to the idea of big society, very discredited, uh, or quite discredited in some circles. It was actually Cameron's biggest idea, and then he's kind of let it go. But actually what he did was, in education, he did something which nobody in the world, no country in the world has done to the scale of the UK, which is to say, here is, a, here is a public service delivered by the state. Why can't it be just funded by the state and delivered by other people, or delivered by a combination of the state and other people? So even though he never actually defined it like that, the biggest application of the big society was in schools. Uh, there are lots of other places where you can apply the big society, which is basically harnessing 
volu the voluntary spirit, har har harnessing the altruism of everybody to work together with whether it's the public or the private sector. But this is the single biggest example. And it's actually the biggest example worldwide, as far as I know. Now, uh, what, are the problem, what is the problem we try to solve in education? The problem is essentially that there is a vast difference between the performance of good schools and bad schools. And this is just the, 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 there's a tale of very poorly performing schools, pretty evenly across the country. Um, uh, but if basically, if you go to one of the top 10% schools, you're pretty well set up. And if you go to one of the bottom 10% schools, uh, postal lottery, you, you, your life is, you, you're really going to struggle to get out of the, the, the poor opportunities you've had uh, as a pupil, as a child. It also happens that, that those poor schools are very highly correlated to disadvantage. So communities, poorer communities have worse schools. And this is just a scatter plot of, the, of results in English and maths, GCSE versus children on the pupil premium. And you can see there's a strong, uh, the strong relationship, which has uh, been there for a very long time. Uh, but at least now, for the last 10 years, it's been a focus of public policy. Um, and it's worse now because of the consequences of the, of the, of the difference in schooling. Now, Andrew Adonis, um, in, who was the founder of the Academies movement, when he came to Sunderland, he, he, he told this, he said this thing, 20 years ago when the boys left here, this is what a head teacher in Sunderland said to Andrew Adonis, uh, they walked down the hill and turned left to get a job in the shipyard or right to go down to the mines. All these jobs have gone. They might as well walk straight into the sea. And, and, the, and the problem is, 30, 40 years ago, there were still jobs with dignity if you, didn't, if you left school poorly educated. Today, that's not the case. But still, we have almost half the children in this country leave school inadequately educated. Uh, and, it, and, it, and it's creating enormous problems, some of which Bill is, Bill is, Bill is dealing with. Um, so what have ARC done? We started in 2004. Uh, and this is our theory of change. Now, what I want to say from the outset, as you will probably want to tell me, we knew nothing about education. I had zero qualifications. I and my colleagues, zero qualifications for doing anything about this problem, for doing well. So what did we do? We, tried, we worked out, well, who are the pe best people in the world at this? And let's find out what they do. And the only people who actually really did this well were in the States, because Clinton had set up the charter school program. And there were several chains of charter schools which did this extremely well, which the fam most famous probably is KIPP, but there's a, four or five of them. We went over, we studied them, we spent time with them. Uh, and um, uh, we came up with a set of six pillars, which, are, which have been the arc pillars for 15 years and will continue to be our sustainable pillars. And um, the interesting thing is, having worked out from uh, KIPP schools, which is the, the foremost one, what, the, what those key pillars should be, we then discovered there was one person in the United Kingdom who had almost identical pillars, an almost identical theory of change. Uh, and that was somebody called Michael Wilshaw, who was the head teacher of Mossbourne, which was the most successful academy in Britain. And he ended up to become chief inspector of schools. And we didn't know that at the time, but he had a very similar theory of change. Now, the six pillars, high expectations. You have to, most of these children have no expectations of going to university, no expectations of doing well at school. They've got no expectations from home or from their community. So you have to completely change their vision for their lives. Secondly, you have to have, uh, you have to set very, very strict rules around behavior. And th now the middle class, people like me, uh, believe you should give children lots of freedom. Uh, they've got to experiment, blah, 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 blah. That doesn't work in, uh, in, with schools in difficult neighborhoods. What, the kid, what those kids need is social norms. They need the opposite, almost, of what middle class kids need. And the, and the most people in most schools, basically the school system has been run by the middle class, for the middle class. And, and, and most people ignored the needs of the kids that, uh, that were coming to these schools. And so anyway, you, we, ha we, we have to create completely new social, what we call social norms, a completely new, new set of boundaries around the kids, and that's what they need. And they respond incredibly well. Uh, thirdly, knowing every child. Now, that means both knowing them in, a, in, in terms of empathy and support, 
but also knowing him in the same way that Bill described in terms of measuring everything. And this is, if you like, a hedge fund mentality. We measure every child in every subject, in every class, every day, and we measure the performance of every teacher in every subject, in every class, every day, because that's the only way you work out what's being done well, what's being done badly, who's falling behind, how you can keep moving. Uh, and uh, that, for some people, the use of data can be threatening. Uh, and, it, and, and the government has actually had a lot of problems in the way they've applied data to education. But used correctly, it can be done in an incredibly supportive way and be transformative. Fourthly, depth before breadth. Um, the freedom in the curriculum given by in the academy reforms meant that you could spend much more time than historically on English and maths. Basically, most kids in, in the schools that we were dealing with were, were weak in English and maths. And because of that, they couldn't access the other subjects well. Unless you build a sort of firm foundation in English and maths, you'll never get to be able to access the full curriculum. So we took maximum capability to just focus on English and maths so that we, we just nailed down literacy and numeracy before anything else. Fifth, more time for learning, extended schools, uh, we, we, which is what we, you learn from private schools. Give the children as, as much time as possible on the, what is an oasis of the school grounds for them. And finally, excellent teaching. Without excellent teachers, you'll never have excellent schools. And you'll never have excellent schools without excellent teachers. And so teaching, as we've learned more and more, it's absolutely, if you want to go from good to great, you just need outstanding teachers. So those are, that's our theory of change. Um, what have we done? This just compares ARC with the, with the largest uh, seven or eight chains of academies. And uh, it's, it, but in terms of uh, the, uh, the attainment of the children when they arrive at the school. So we specifically char target the weakest schools in the weakest neighborhoods to make, so that we can make a difference. And that we are, along with EACT, uh, we have the, 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 by, by far the, the weakest intake of kids in terms of attainment. And, that, and that's very, very closely linked to uh, ad advantage as well. This is where we've, what we've done geographically. We started with secondaries. Then we realized it was too late at secondaries. So you, you've got to go to primaries. Uh, which we started later, you see, in 2011. We've out now realized primaries is too late, so we're going to start doing nurseries. Um, and um, we started in London, which is where we're based. We then moved, moved into Birmingham, and we, we took on several of the Trojan Horse schools. Uh, and then we said, well, actually, what, what are the hardest schools in the country? They're actually coastal, wh white, working-class coastal communities, because that's where you have the the hardest issue in terms of aspiration from the, from the families and parents. Immigrant communities in London, for example, are actually some of the easiest uh, children to get good results from because they have very aspirational families. Um, but that's what we've done, and we're now up to uh, 38 here, uh, and, and now 40, 41 schools. Um, and this is what we've achieved. This, this, looks at, this is the secondary schools. Um, on the left is, is the... There is the attainment in uh, GCSEs or the, or the new um, framework, um, attainment eight, uh, from when we took it on to when it, where it is now. Uh, some of them, the, in, where they're in white, they were new start schools. That's why there's, there's no founding dot. And new starts are much easier than transitions. That's why they're better. Uh, and most of them we've, we've increased uh, quite significantly. One of them has gone backwards, which is in, in Camden in London. Uh, and then those are the Ofsted scores. Uh, same for primaries. Primaries are easier than secondaries. They're smaller, and you can uh, have, a, have a bigger impact on the, uh, on the children. Uh, and, it, and it's very, very direct. And, 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 and particularly by having, we were talking with Pauline, but having, using synthetic phonics makes an imme immense difference to the, to the children uh, in, in getting them started. Uh, and again, the Ofsted rankings. Uh, this is nationally, now nation closing the gap between ch children to disadvantaged kids and the rest has been a national policy since the coalition. Um, and indeed, the, the DFE, they had, uh, closing the gap was on all the wall, they had the phrase on the walls uh, all the way through the DFE. So it was a big priority. Well, how much progress have they made nationally? They've gone from a gap of 27 points 
uh, uh, 29 points to, uh, 27, uh, to 27. So it's a small, small closing, but not huge. Uh, at ARC, we're currently, our, our pupil, pupil, pupil premium attainment gap is uh, eight points compared with the national number of 27. Primary, it's 14 versus 19. If I'm confident about anything, it's that we'll close that, uh, the primary attainment gap very rapidly from now, much, much further. Um, and then innovation. I mentioned at the beginning that the thing that uh, philanthropy can bring very easily when it c collaborates with the public sector is more innovation. And so out of our, we, we basically have these 40 schools now, which is just like a seedbed for other innovations. So we've used it to launch a whole bunch of other things, uh, including teacher training, future leaders, which is a, to training up head teachers, teaching leaders for middle teachers, art teacher training for all teachers. We're now going to have a graduate school of teaching in Hammersmith, uh, um, for, where hopefully we're going to teach a lot of teachers, not only for art, but for the national uh, system. And then we've launched new curriculum programs, Math Mastery, which is now in 500 schools, uh, which is based on the Singapore approach to how you teach maths and make sure children cannot move on to the next level until they've mastered each subject. Uh, English Mastery, we're now launching Science Mastery. And then last year we launched Now Teach, which you may have heard about uh, with somebody called Lucy Kellaway, but it's basically helping people have a second career in their 40s and 50s if they want to become a teacher because there's a massive national teaching shortage. So we brought them into the teaching net uh, and that's going, growing very rapidly. And then conditions for success and lessons learned. First condition for success is outstanding leadership. And my view is to, to, to launch a charity or a philanthropic effort, you need two things. You need an idea and a great leader. And, uh, and then the leader who can execute. Uh, and uh, if, if you find those great leaders, your problems are largely solved. But, but my partner in business and in ARC, Ian Ways, he, he always likes to say that uh, successful entrepreneurship and philanthropy is 10% uh, idea and 90% execution. So really, it's, it's, you need that, that getting that right person to lead it is absolutely crucial. Learn from the best. I said that we went, we, we, we went out at the beginning to learn from others, and we're doing that all the time. You've got to stay constantly humble about your role in the, in the, in the ecosystem. Who's doing something better than you? What can you learn from them? What can you learn from each other? It's all about improving all the time and learning from others. Um, stay evidence-based and data-driven. We're, we're in a kind of post-truth world, aren't we? Uh, and, um, but, but actually, in schools, it's very easy to look at the data. There's a huge amount of data. You can work out what works and what doesn't work, uh, and you can learn from it and pick it up quickly. Harness altruism. The whole um, theory of change, by the way, taught in every business school around the world for the last 80 years is wrong because it's based it's on the principle that humans are rational and self-interested. They're, neither, they're, neither, they're certainly not rational, and they are neither, they're not, nor simplistically self-interested. Everybody has an element of altruism. And so, uh, in, obviously, what, in, in philanthropy, you're trying to harness that altruism and turn it to the advantage of the charity and to the people who benefit. And then keep your focus. And if we've done one thing wrong at ARC, I think we have, which is we, which we were too ambitious. We've, we've taken on too many challenges. Um, we, we've gone beyond London into Birmingham, into the, onto the south coast. We're, we're very, very stretched. The result is that last year, four of our London schools did much worse than I expected. Uh, we can solve it, but it's, a, it's an error on our part. So keeping your focus, keeping your discipline is, is absolutely critical. Uh, and our ambitions for the future. Uh, we want to deliver, obviously, the first priority is every child in every ARC school. That is, that is what matters. It's the, the, the specific children whose lives you have the opportunity to transform. So that's our number one overriding responsibility. We also, though, want to make ARC an exemplar for, the pri for primary and secondary education in the country. Fifteen years ago, I, I think there was immense complacency in this country about education. Uh, I, I, still there is, I think there still is quite a lot of it. Uh, it is totally, for me, totally, totally unacceptable that 40% of children in this country leave school without the ability to access the basic skills for employment. 40%. 
20% it's dire. And it, by the way, it runs all the way through the population. Britain, compared with a lot of other countries, has this tail of low skill. Which, so this problem has been going on for many generations, for two generations, and it's still the case. So we want to, to really make a statement that it is possible in, with children from disadvantaged communities, with poor prior attainment, to actually get them to the level which they can, where they can properly access the, the, the world of work and access university. So, and therefore, by that, we want to change the national conversation uh, about education. And ultimately, we want the country to, to, we want to do our part in eliminating the tail of underperformance in this country. And um, the motive, R.H. Tawney, one of my heroes, um, what a wise parent would desire for his or her own children, a nation must desire for its children. And I don't think, as a nation, we desire enough for the, the children of this country that they all fulfill the, the maximum of their potential. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Now handing over to Fran Perrin. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here today. It's, it's quite an illustrious panel to be on, um, so I'm going to try and do my best to follow those two amazing speakers. Giving away money is easy. Giving it away well is surprisingly hard. So my goal is enlightened self-interest. I want to make it easier to do my job as well as I can. And hopefully that will also radically increase the impact and efficacy of all of our work as philanthropists. I'm a philanthropist. My foundation is called the Indigo Trust. We're a grant-making foundation, and we give about a million pounds a year. I want to share with you not the work that we fund, but the lessons I've learned as a donor. At the heart of it, it feels like we're giving blind. I inherited wealth when I turned 18, and with it the privilege but the responsibility to do as good a job of giving it away as I could. At that age, I didn't know what I was going to do in life, let alone what it meant to be a strategic and effective donor. I knew I wanted to give the money away and to make as much change as I could. So I've been trying to find out what the hell I should fund for the last 20 years. Philanthropy is an extremely inefficient market. It's like tra trying to make investments with no market information, no Reuters, no FTSE 100, no stock exchange. I thought it was just me who didn't know what was going on, who didn't know what to fund, who to talk to. But if we're honest, this is a remarkably opaque field. If philanthropists and foundations were hotels, what kind of reviews would we get from the charities we fund and the causes who are trying to get funding from us? I decided to look at my own statistics for the Indigo Trust. In the last three years, we received 818 proposals, and we funded just 104 of them. I calculated that's two years, nine months' worth of time spent by charities, and these are small, local charities, writing proposals for projects that we were never going to fund because they don't fit our criteria. So instead of a harmonious relationship between charities and donors, it feels more like this. The whole process is ridiculously frustrating for both sides. It's taking away precious staff time from amazing charities, and our impact as donors is reduced. It's a deeply inefficient market, but one where we as donors will never go bust. If philanthropy was on social media, our relationship status would probably say it's complicated. Hundreds of thousands of charities, thousands of donors in the UK alone, there is an incredible long tail. And it's really hard to find the information about who funds what. It's locked away on our internal finance systems or in PDF reports. As donors, we report to the Charity Commission, but we're not legally required to publish the useful information, what we funded, publicly. Many donors don't mean to be opaque, but they've never been on the other side of the funding table. They've never been the volunteer fundraiser in a tiny charity who's spending hours and hours trying to find out who might fund them. Our reports as donors are showcased, designed to showcase our achievements, not to make life easier for applications. 
and we don't know what we don't know. We only fund the projects we happen to hear about. Andrew Carnegie was an extraordinary example in the history of philanthropy. But grant funding has not modernised as fast as the rest of the world. In 1889, Carnegie wrote the gospel of wealth. He laid the groundwork for modern funding, that the rich should redistribute wealth to good causes for maximum public benefit. But not much has changed since then. Bill Gates, Pierre Amidiar, George Soros made money by radical innovation in their sectors, by being disruptors. But none of them would run their businesses with as little information as we have in foundations. We should be philanthropists of the Google era. I wanted it to be as easy as this. I wanted to search for other donors to see what they were funding so I could learn from it. I couldn't find that information except by the slow and inefficient time spent at conferences or donor collaborative meetings or trawling through expensively printed glossy reports. I asked, why does it have to be so hard to find out what the hell is going on? It turns out there's no good reason except that it's hard to make donors do anything they don't want to do. So three years ago, I set up 360 Giving. It's a campaign to get all donors, foundations and grant makers, publishing openly to a common standard. Better data for better grants. I looked for the simplest unit of information, the grant, and I asked why it can't be open data. We tested the idea with data scientists from an amazing group called the Open Data Services Cooperative and with charity leaders and charity academics. We built a data standard and that just means a common format. It's not artificial intelligence or blockchain or wizardry. It's just saying we'll all put the amount of the grant in column A, who it went to in column B, things like that. It's just a spreadsheet. It's not rocket science, but it's open. It's published on the internet. It's reusable, there's no copyright, and it's comparable because we're all using the same format. Because it's just a spreadsheet, any grant maker, big or small, with staff of thousands or of ones or twos, can publish their data. Standards aren't exciting or sexy. It's really hard to do a glossy fundraising campaign around data standards, but they are the infrastructure that makes modern life work. And that standardization makes it possible to answer really basic questions like who's funding what? Who might fund me? Where should I fund? And much to my surprise, it's working. So far, we have nearly 100 donor organizations in the UK publishing over 290,000 grants, which together are worth over 25 billion pounds, published to the 360 standard from huge donors like the Big Lottery Fund and the Wellcome Trust to community foundations like Newcastle, Tyne and Weir, which has been a really early adopter and innovator in this, and tiny family foundations with hardly any staff. My job as a donor is to go around persuading people to open up that information. They're doing it voluntarily. They're doing it because they think it will help all of our work. Many of them have never been asked before. It's a lot of information that's suddenly flooding out. So we built GrantNav, which is a very simple search engine. If you can use Google, you can use this. You don't need any spe special skills. And GrantNav means that you can go online. Try it, play with it. It's free for anyone to use. You can just search. All the code is open and free. Imagine being able to search and find the people who might fund your work. Imagine being able to search for what you should support. And because the data and the code is open, products and tools and platforms are springing up to use the data in ways we hadn't even predicted. Beehive is one of my favourite examples. We didn't set this up. It's a matchmaking tool for charities with potential funders. So charities can go on, enter their details, and the site will suggest to them places that they should apply for funding based on 360 data that's out there. Patchwork Philanthropy is a wonderful report produced by the Young Foundation and it used 360 data to show that areas in the country receiving less grant funding were more likely to have voted leave in the referendum. They were able to overlay voting patterns with 360 grant data. We wanted to bring the stories behind these grants to life, so we funded a data visualisation challenge 
and got loads of innovative projects coming forward, people who had an idea on how to use this data to help with decisions. There's tools like this, which let you see which donors are supporting core funding rather than just project and program costs. Or let you see whether the most deprived areas of the country are actually getting the most grant funding. Data that was very hard to get before. You could look at an index of deprivation, but you couldn't get a complete picture of where funding was going in those communities. And if you're a donor, we should know this information. We should know if we're targeting our money where it's needed. Suddenly, our sector is coming alive with data. If you're thinking that this is easy and obvious, then ask yourself why it wasn't done before. We are answering questions we haven't been able to answer before. Answers for academics, for charities, and for donors. I want the future of philanthropy to be transformed into a data-rich world, reducing the inefficiencies, making our philanthropy more strategic, and magnifying its impact for all of us. Thank you. So now we have our final presentation before the question and answer session from Sir Peter Farty. Well, thank you very much for, for having me. I should have been called Arthur Askey and I could have been at the beginning of the queue instead of the end. I've been uh, involved in the foundation work since uh, 1989 when I floated the car business and put a load of the shares into the Vardy Foundation. And that's funded a, a range of issues that I... Uh, have been uh, passionate about uh, and I sold the company in 2006 and uh, decided to devote the rest of my life and the, uh, the money that I'd made to social action programs. Quite often people ask me, you know, if you want to get involved with charity work or philanthropy, uh, how do you get started? And I said, well, find something that excites you or find something that makes you angry and do something about it. So my story, uh, I was involved in schools. Uh, I tried to get involved in youth zones with Bill. That's a fabulous project. And we had two on the cards here. I raised all the money for the two up here. And unfortunately, the local authorities changed their minds just as we were about to start to build them. Uh, but. After I'd sold the business, I was invited to go to a Young Offenders Institute. And why on earth I was going to a Young Offenders Institute? My two, three colleagues have just said, actually, we get involved in things we have no clue about. We haven't a, an idea. Why, why did we build schools? And, uh, you know, neither Paul nor I are headmasters. We're not teachers. We're not anything. But you get the opportunity to do something and you try and use the experience that you've gained in life and in business to improve whatever we turn our hands to. But I went to the, this Young Offenders Institute and uh, it was through the County Durham Foundation and it was a Seeing is Believing tour. And I was there with Margaret Barbara, Barbara Jackets and Sarah Nicholson, the Vaux Brewery family. And so we asked, you know, how many guys have you got in here? Well, that 450 young men, that 650 staff, the cost per guy is 47,000 pounds. So the cost of that operation is 21 million pounds a year. 60% of the guys in there were ex foster care leavers and 70% will reoffend within 12 months so you think what a broken system that is on average 43% of care leavers end up in prison obviously they're in a few times but I thought what am I doing here what, what, why have I come here like my other two colleagues, I'm a person of faith. So I believe that that was a journey that God took me on to say, well, you know, what are you going to do about this? So never having been inside prison before, uh, I was a car salesman, but we never got to prison. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I ended up buying that house in, in Hexham. Uh, it was previously the Bishop of Hexham's house. And I thought, the guy's coming out of prison, actually I have nowhere to go. If they've been in care and they're in prison, they come out, there's no family to come out to. There's no father or mother, there's no home, there's no job. So you can't wonder the 70% reoffend. So I thought, well, they need a home. They need a community to belong to, and they need meaningful work. We've got 40 guys in there. There's absolutely no cost to the public purse at all. We don't take unemployment benefit, and we don't take housing allowance. Which means that if the guys don't work, they don't eat. So we develop a work ethic instead of a dependency culture. And we developed gardening teams, furniture restoration, shops in Hexham. And it's, it's been quite amazing. But there's only 40 guys in there. We've started a women's house and we're just about to buy another men's house. But there's thousands coming out of prison. So you look at that and think, well, where do you start? So today, there are 93,000 going on a 100,000 children in care. 6% will go to university. They might not sub study the best of subjects, but the 6% will go to university. 43% will go to prison before they're 21. 61% of girls aged between 15 and 18 in custody have spent time in care. We just need to look at the newspapers over the last few weeks to see the dreadful time that some of these girls have that have been trafficked uh, and abused in our society. I don't know whether you saw BBC Two last night. Uh, 1,300 young people are on the streets of Manchester uh, because they have no home, they're living rough or sofa surfing. And the government is spending £3.4 billion a year on the care system. Do we want a prison experience for them? Or do we want a transformational philanthropy solution? We obviously chose the second one. I did inquire about building prisons after I'd built schools, but I thought we'd better do something a bit different. So the causes of all these kids going into care going into prison and coming through the prison system is the breakdown of the family. I think we all accept that. The mothers are unable to cope with the pressures that they face and the children end up being taken into care. Now, I'm a car salesman and our friends here are from different areas of business. So we have, have no experience in this at all. But as with the car business, I toured the world to try and find what good looked like. If I could find what good looked like, I knew what I was aiming for. So I ended up going to Chicago. I'd been to San Francisco and a few other places before that. But in Chicago, I found this guy, Dr. Dave Anderson, who's a child psychologist. He'd previously been working with the uh, the uh, children's uh, services in, Gla in uh, Chicago to interview children to find enough information to lock the parents up and send them to prison. And he's a man of faith as well, and he thought, this is crazy, I shouldn't be doing this, I should be working on the other side. So he started this organisation at the top, uh, Safe Families for Children. They have managed in Chicago to half the number of children going into care. They save Chicago $31 million a year, and it's all done to prevent child neglect and abuse, stabilize families at time of crisis, and reduce the number of children going into care. There's three elements to this, and it's all done by volunteers. There are family friends, people who get alongside these uh, ladies and guys, if the guys are still there, that are going through stress and strain, and they 
undertake to look after them like an aunt, an uncle, or a grandparent, a member of the family that walks alongside them. Host families, if the child needs to be taken out of the home for a period of time, a couple of days, a couple of weeks, a couple of months, uh, the volunteers uh, offer to do that. Uh, we're doing mother and baby hosting, so we take the mother and the, the child as well now, as that's developing. And the third one is resource friends. You could all be resource friends. I could have all your emails and we could put you all on as, as resource friends this afternoon because what we're looking for is these girls need a pushchair, a carry cot, a bed. They need the house decorating. They need a bit of furniture. They need all sorts of things. We needed a washing machine the other day. So we just put it online and we said, we don't want a second hand washing machine, just give us some money. We had 625 pounds in 20 minutes to go and buy a new washing machine for this, this lady. It's heartbreaking really when you see the situation of some of these uh, families that we're living in. Half of our society doesn't know how the other half are living. And when you get involved, it doesn't half wake you up and make you want to do something. So we brought it back to the, the UK. I had to write it in English, in English instead of Yankee Doodle Dandy because folks in the UK don't accept American programs. It has to be English. Uh, so we wrote everything, got everything passed, uh, safeguarding of children and all the programs. And we rolled it out into local authorities in the northeast here. We recruited a thousand volunteers very quickly. Uh, so they're from Newcastle down to Teesside. Uh, and we got started. Um, I then got a call from uh, Ian Duncan Smith uh, about a car matter. I don't know. <laughs> he wasn't wanting a car. Uh, well, I'll tell you what it was. Uh, there's a, a scheme called Motability. Some of you will know Motability. Motability uh, is, uh, needs changing, shall I say. And he was Department of Work and Pensions and really wanted me to give him a hand because I'd obviously been in the car business. So I said, well, I'll come and tell you what I'm doing uh, at the same time as I'll tell you what to do about motability. So he said, yeah, please do. So I took all the brochures down for Safe Families for Children and had an hour of his time with all his entourage that were there. And he heard about Safe Families for Children and he ended up jumping on a plane and coming out to Chicago to meet Dave Anderson, meet Director of Children's Services, to really understand, you know, is this really working? And he has been helpful in getting me some matched government funding and we've expanded it in, in other areas. So now we're with 33 local authorities, we support 3,000 families, 7,000 children, 5,000 bed nights, 4,000 volunteers. We've got 800 churches and community groups and we're reducing the flow of looked after children uh, by over 17%. And the aim is to reduce the number of children going into care by 20% with the partnering local authorities. I was with my ex-partner and we were taking drugs at the time, sociable drugs at the weekend, but still that mucked my head up. And that's how me and my partner split up. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't be with him and come off that. I knew I couldn't. Xander is my son, he's four years old. I was struggling to cope with Xander because he has behavioural problems. Because there's not a day that goes past that you have a good day. You'll have an, a no bad day. The actual good days don't happen. Every morning when you wake up, you know what your day's going to be you know how it's going to work out. I just wasn't coping, it was, it was extremely hard. My brain wasn't in the right place because when your brain's unwell, it's hard to deal with these kinds of things. Like last year, I didn't feel like I wanted to be here and I would never have the, the balls to do anything like that, but I still felt like that. And that's even getting up in the morning and going in a bath and getting a pair of leggings on and a top and you're feeling that low and you're feeling that isolated and you feel like you've got nowhere to turn to, that's difficult. And I, I couldn't cope. I needed help. I heard about the Safe Families through the Social Work Department. It was a new thing that had just came out. I was actually one of the first couple of people that got put forward for it. Linda is the lady from Safe Families. We got on really well. 
It started with Linda picking him up from nursery and keeping him till tea time. A few weeks after that, she started taking him overnight. So it enabled me to like maybe have a night out or maybe just go and visit friends and things like that. So I knew that Xander had something to look forward to and I had something to look forward to at least once a week. And then there was Marilyn. Marilyn was a family friend. If I had any stresses or things that were going on in my life, I could meet up with her once every couple of weeks. Like I would get that off my chest. I started getting up, I started getting myself dressed every day. I started making sure that I was well presented. I got myself a job, all things like that. We are. When I was feeling that way last year, I couldn't have done any of these things. I couldn't have, because I, I wasn't in the position to do it. At one point I was in my bed all the time because I was severely depressed, it brought me out of that. It, it just, it helps. It, it does, it really does. <laughs> Join us in helping families in crisis get back on their feet. Ask about becoming a volunteer. Contact us today to find out more. We we'll see there just one of the thousands who have helped when mothers are supported, education improves. Xander went to school. She was able to get him up, give him breakfast, get him to school. The behavioural problems were reduced. The pressure on the HS, she didn't need the stress tablets and the, uh, the constant visit to the doctor. Uh, the Department of Works and Pensions Benefits, she got a job. So the, the household was much stronger. And when the mother gets stronger, Everyone wins. So Save Families Vision is to be in every town and city in Britain with uh, 100,000 uh, volunteers and reduce the number of children in care from the 69,000 we've got today by at least 25,000. Thank you. So I'd just like to invite the panel to come back. So, Thank uh, you. J James Tooley. Um, yeah, a, a surprise for me today, a very pleasant surprise, was the way at least three of the four panel mentioned faith as being an important motivator for them. This, so this relationship between faith and philanthropy is interesting to me. I mean, what is it in particular about the faith that motivates you? Is it that God has been generous to you, so you want to be generous to back? Is it a sort of Matthew 25, 40 thing where you want to look after the, 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 the less blessed in society, what you did for the less blessed you did for, 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 for the master. Uh, and so the, that's the sort of, what is it that actually focuses that? And then how do you relate to secular philanthropists if faith is such an important part of what you motivates you? Thank you, James. Who'd like to take that one on? Well, I uh, had a bad start in life. Uh, I had a uh, report from school that said I would never ever do anything. I was hopeless, and, uh, you know. And yet, I felt God's hand on me throughout my life because I could never have achieved what I achieved with the Reg Vardy business unless I'd had some support. Now I had a good, I had a great father, but he died when I was quite young. So I attribute uh, the success that I've got a lot to my faith and to God's care and keeping and guidance and direction. But he's, a, a, you know, as a result of the business growing, I mean, I sold it and it was the biggest car deal that's ever been done. I've ended up with, uh, with wealth that I feel needs to be used uh, in, in society and to help others. I feel that the volunteer army that's out there is principally the church. If we're looking to feed the hungry, uh, look after the, the poor, and house the homeless, there is no better set of people prepared and in their DNA to do it. And that's why it's easy to call on them as volunteers. I'm not saying others can't do it, so please don't, please don't generalize. But when, when you're looking for volunteers and you need to build groups of 10 or 20 people because they have to, they have to form a group uh, to, to help families. It's a f family around a family. Then the churches, of all the descriptions and denominations, you know, it's not any one, it's all, uh, are the easiest folks to go to to recruit the volunteers. So faith has played a lot in my life and it, it plays out a lot in, uh, in the philanthropy. Uh, there's lots of things that are not faith-related that we support. 
Uh, but, you know, the, the driving factor is that I've been blessed beyond belief and I need to do something to justify that in my own mind. Thank you, Peter. Would anybody else like to chip in there? Uh, well, I, I'd echo quite a lot of that. God has been, I think God has been very gracious to me. I've been uh, very blessed. Um, I take a lot of um, uh, lesson from, from, from the, the parable of the talents, which is very well known, but I mean, the important, if you've been blessed, you have a responsibility to use that and to be good steward with, with what you've been given. Uh, and from the biggest message for me in the, uh, in the gospel is, is, is around fruitfulness. And my kind of daily prayer is to be fruitful, to bear fruit. Uh, and I pray for other people and for my family and so on. Um, but equally, to echo Peter, I don't think my, my, my arc is made up of people who have all faiths and none. It's, 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 quite a few of them are Jewish, atheists, Christians. Uh, so I, and, and, I, and my business partner um, does not have faith, and he's been uh, as generous as me, if not more generous. And actually, I, I'm totally at admiration because how he does that without faith, <laughs> I, just, I just think that's incredible. Uh, so I think you do, faith gives a spur, uh, without which I think it's just a bit harder, but I'm, I'm all the more admir admiring. Thank you very much. Bill, do you want to... Well, it's just, uh, it, it, the, my faith wasn't a uh, driving force uh, to the charity at all. It's, uh, it's a background, a very personal thing to me. Uh, I think all faiths have a, a very similar guide to life. Um, about giving back, I think that's there in all religions. Um, but it's been uh, it's been really handy uh, to me to make it all make sense <laughs> somehow. I don't know, but uh, it's it's not uh, it hasn't been a driving force for for my uh, philanthropy. It is a very personal thing to me. Thanks. Thanks very much for that. Next question. Um, yes, lady at the back there. Um, Jane Gibson, UK Community Foundations. I wonder uh, if I might ask the panel, was it a, a intervention from a beneficiary that sparked the idea or from a formal philanthropy network which made you think about making the big decisions that you've made to have a huge part of your life around philanthropic activity. Thanks very much. Who'd like to take that one on? Fran? Um, it's, a, it's a great question. and I, I'm always fascinated to know how people get started in a, in a career of giving. I had a slightly unusual start because I was from a philanthropic family. So my trust is one of the Sainsbury Family Charitable Trusts. There are 18 different trusts. So it's kind of assumed that you will give. Um, and I meet a lot of people in family foundations where it's come from that first family experience. I also know a lot of donors who are questioning how do they get their children to, to join them and, and how to join in with that family foundation. But often it's meeting, actually any charity meeting beneficiaries will wake up something that says, I have the ability to help this, so I should. Uh, for me, I never doubted that I was going to give, but I didn't know how to find the cause, the issue. Um, and I, I happen to do something called the Philanthropy Workshop, which is training for donors on how to be strategic, how to find your cause. And for me, it was saying, I need to find something that I do know about, that I'm personally, personally passionate about and knowledgeable about, because that will make me a more effective donor. Thank you, Fran. Would MD uh, like to This is one call. thing um, which might be helpful, which I didn't have time to talk about, but. One of the triggers, and the trigger that got us into schools, was actually government policy. And this is quite interesting, because uh, when, when we set up ARC, we, we basically, as I mentioned, we started off essentially in Africa and, and Eastern Europe. And that was because every dollar went much, much further. I mean, we, we basically, uh, with $5 you sa in South Africa, you saved a life. Uh, and uh, whereas you know, we looked at the UK, how could we make an equivalent difference in the UK. The, the, just what the money just didn't go as far. And then um, the, the Blair government introduced the academies program. And for, you know, it's, it's quite controversial, its foundings, in the sense that they, the government was very generous. They, they paid, well, they pay all of the costs of the school, plus they pay 
they, they, they gave you 20, if you gave two million pounds, but the government then gave you 20 million, gave the school, not you, but they gave the, the <laughs> 20 million pounds to invest in the school. So your two million pound donation effectively was levered. You got 20 million of government money plus uh, the, the lifetime running costs of the school. Um, so it suddenly made your, the, the impact you could have with a small, relatively small amount of money much, much bigger. So that's an, that's an example of how government can actually be clever in bringing in m money. And it, the comparison is India, where we, we did, uh, we've done a couple of schools in India, but the government insists that they will only pay 75% of the running costs of the school. So if you're trying to create something which is sustainable in perpetuity uh, and build a lot of schools, suddenly you've got a very large funding shortfall. So the Indian government have been chosen to be less generous than the British government, and it's preventing philanthropists from coming in. Thanks very much. Peter, do you want uh, to add something? I think for me, uh, the, the opportunities have come along and presented themselves to me. I, you know, I was invited to build a school uh, and with one O-level in music and uh, le <laughs> left school at 16, I felt ideally qualified. <laughs> uh, but you, you sit down and work these things out. Uh, and I think everybody in the audience has the same sort of opportunity to do something. They, they might not have the money that the folks this side of the table have. But I think everybody has the opportunity to, to give and to improve our society. Uh, we're working in Nottingham with Nottingham uh, City Council with Safe Families for Children. And their motto is people helping people. And if each one of us helps one or two, we improve society dramatically. And I mean, I've had some wonderful opportunities and I've been able to say yes to them. Uh, and the, the opportunities are still coming along. But I think for all of us, it's not just those that have money that can do good. That's an attitude of mind and it's a preparedness to say, yes, let's have a go. Mm. And we can all do remarkable things uh, in our own communities. Thank you very much. What about this side of the amphitheatre? Yes, Sandra. Thanks. I'm Sandra King, Community Foundation, Tynemoor, Northumberland. So one of the things we're wanting to question in this Generosity Festival is philanthropy's role in civic society. Um, and you've all been blazing your own brilliantly inspiring trails in terms of what you see the role is. I suppose if you think about everything that's going on, Brexit, shrinking local authority budgets, in the next five years, how do you think the role of philanthropists might change in civic society? Do you see it's going to change? Will you carry on the same? Do you think you need to step up, step down, move sideways? You know, what, what difference might we see? That's interesting. So the role of philanthropy changing in the next five years, perhaps with some of the challenges like Brexit that we have to cope with. Mm. Who'd like to take this one on? Fran. That's, that's a big question. <laughs> um, I think you could argue that the role of philanthropy doesn't change. Um, I... I'm, I'm a believer in state intervention. I think we have incredible services provided in this country that philanthropy wouldn't be able to afford to deliver. Um, for me, the, the great added advantage of philanthropy is in advocacy, it's in persuading government to do things, and it's in innovation. If you look back, I'm sure in the, the 900 years of philanthropy here, a lot of the social movements started in funding from philanthropy, um, but we can't afford to deliver them at scale. So uh, I hope we don't go back to a historic vision of philanthropy where it's benevolence from wealthy people or nothing. Um, I like the fact that we have rights to a certain level of service in this country. The difficulty is when government starts to withdraw, do we as philanthropists step in and fill the gap? And the temptation to do that is really strong because we see services cut, we see people suffering, and we know we can deliver that. But then you lose any innovation, you lose any new solutions. Um, I think every foundation struggles with that question, but it's already happening. We're already seeing um, increasing demands, increasing need. Uh, there was an Association of Charitable Foundations conference last week, and the number one problem that foundations cited was a lack of resources. So this is the, the philanthropists themselves <laughs> saying they don't have enough money to solve the problems. Um, 
I would say this, but I think we can't make decisions about where to direct funding if we don't know where the funding's going. So let's at least make informed decisions when we're tackling those problems. Thank you, Peter. I, I would like to see more partnership uh, between philanthropists and uh, the public sector. Uh, I mean, all four of us are trying to show what good looks like. We've toured the world, we've found out what good looks like, we've brought it home, we've put it into practice. Now, we need to scale that up, but we need to work with local authorities. I mean, in, in my area, there is no money for early intervention. No money at all. That is absolutely criminal. If we don't start early and yeah. sort these problems out early, we'll build more prisons and we'll have more and more folks behind bars. It's very cost effective to be doing what we're doing, using volunteers. Uh, the schools, the youth zones, youth zones obviously have to raise a lot of money, six, seven million pounds to build one. Local authorities are sitting on fortunes of money. It's capital, they're not allowed to spend, uh, you know, capital as revenue, but they're sitting on a lot of money. They could all build a youth zone. You know, it should be government policy that every town and city has a youth zone. It's not a, f in the overall scheme of things, that's not a fortune. Be a bit of a job for Bill to manage them all, but. Uh. <laughs> Bill, do you want to come on in? Yeah, uh, there's, uh, uh, as I mentioned when I was uh, doing my piece, the, uh, I see uh, philanthropy changing at grassroots level. I think the young people today have a much, much bigger social conscience than our generation had. Mm -hmm. uh, and I find a lot of optimism in that. But I'd like to see big international businesses in Britain get involved a lot more. Um, I've got very narrow vision just on the sector I'm in, but the involvement of the very big companies is, is tokenism. Um, and I think they've got a much bigger part to play. I think they've got away with it, actually. Uh, I see much more generosity uh, in philanthropy from individuals, much, much more. That's a very interesting perspective. Um, any more? Yes. I'm Ron Beadle, speaking as a local councillor here in this region, a couple of the negatives <laughs> here um, have been about schemes not going ahead because of local government not giving support. Um, so what have you learned from that? And in particular, what have you learned about which level of local government you should be dealing with in order to generate the kind of support that will force the councils to do the right things? Can I come in? Yes, I'm <laughs> um, The last bit first. The, uh, we have to go in at leader and chief executive level. It, it, it just doesn't work if we go in at any other level with a local council. And you would be surprised. You saw the names that went up there. These are not rich councils that have, um, uh, have come in. Um, the, it's the revenue side that... Uh, is the difficult side for local councils. That, that is it. The capital, I think, could easily be swept away. And, you know, to get specific around here, with the two projects that we had here, we had pretty much all of the, uh, all of the money raised, but the revenue uh, could not be found there. And, it, and like um, Paul was saying before, that... The revenue is the risk. If you want sustainability, you need to know that your partner isn't going to... Well, first of all, he's there to start with and that they're not going to leave you uh, high and dry. And in our sector, that, that relationship doesn't exist. Who, you know, to... I feel really sorry. I deal with local councils all the time. I, you know, it's not like you don't want to do things for young people. I mean, that is a ridiculous concept. Of course you do. It'd be, you know, it'd be ridiculous. You're just having the money ripped and ripped and ripped away from you. Um, I find that central government, actually, um, they have no... We have had virtually no help whatsoever uh, from central government. I think we'll get there eventually. But it, it's very difficult for them to, to think in those terms. So we, we keep hoping that central government will say, right, it's a model that works... It clearly works, hundreds of children, confidence is going up, that's the currency we work in, but antisocial behaviour is going down and this sort of thing. We can invest in that. 
But we haven't found the formula yet uh, to help the local councils to make that leap. Um, they'll give us the land, the local councils, they'll give us um, half of the capital, even more in some, some cases. It's just the revenue. Mm. And do you have a site to join in? I'll just add something uh, which is not specific to the Northeast, but um, the, there's somebody called Danny Kruger, who um, uh, is currently, I think he's still uh, head of the civil society unit in the cabinet office. DCMS now. DCMS, right. And um, he, I partnered with him to create something in West London called the West London Zone, which was a project based on the Harlem Zone, but we tr to try and make sure that every single child in that zone, which was three boroughs of London, was given support. All, all the child, children at risk were given support. So it was a place-based initiative rather than a intervention-based initiative. So it was saying, what are all the things we can bring around those children at risk to make sure then they will get they won't be neat it won't be a neat and um, so far it's going, it's been three or four years in it's going very well but it drew on his philosophy which is uh, he he basically believes in what he would call asset based philanthropy so he believes that every community has great assets uh, and most of the way that the state and government thinks about things is about liabilities what is the problem that they can solve. The other side of that equation is, what are the assets of this community that we can bring to bear to deal with these problems? And if every, every community say, well, what are our great assets? How can they be used more? That could be really transformational, but it does, then it needs leadership. It needs the person or the people who can say, here are the assets, here are the problems. How do we use our assets to the, to the max to help deal with the problems? Thank you very much. Lady up the back. Sorry, I haven't got a good enough voice to, to shout <laughs> it's out. It's a long way to shout. <laughs> well, Peter knows me. He might think I do. Um, <laughs> my name's Olivia Grant, and I've been involved in various things in the Northeast for a long time. But I was struck by the importance of volunteers. Because volunteers are the people who are actually the heart blood of a lot of what you do. In these times when a lot of families are feeling a lot of stress, what more do you think either you could be doing, should be doing, or we, the rest of us who are not necessarily directly involved, could do to help support and increase the number of volunteers who can offer their time? Because that is absolutely philanthropic. And, and I'm also concerned that a lot of people are increasingly feeling under stress. And this includes people who are professionals. I think there are some quite serious problems of stress in the education profession at the moment. So how do we help people to effectively and properly use and increase the number of people who are going to be volunteers and supporting either your organizations or others? What more can be done? What more can be done to bring them in, help them, support them, train them, enable them to be marvellous helpers to your, to your projects? That's a very interesting question. So the role of volunteers and how we can better support them, particularly at a time when everybody is feeling increasingly under stress. Fran, do you fancy taking that one on? Just, just a small part, and, and the other panellists will know much more directly than me, but every now and again I talk to politicians from, from either side of the aisle who say, if we could just have more volunteers, everything would be fine. And I always want to go rubbish. We have extraordinary volunteers already in this country. I think we can be very proud of that. And you see in communities the level of effort and time people are willing to give up for no return. And it's often the people with the least time to give who do give it. So as a donor, I don't think I should be doing anything except getting out of their way and supporting the charities who enable their work. It's not, it's not my job to tell anyone that they should volunteer, although I think they'll get a huge amount out of it if they do. Um, but how do we support the charities who are organising volunteers, supporting them, giving counselling to people who deal with very difficult situations? And if, if I, as a donor, can support the charities supporting the volunteers, maybe we won't lose them, but I think we have a lot of them already. Anybody like to chip in, Paul? Yeah, I'd just like to take a slightly contrasting view to that, which is um, going back to the point about... Uh, at local assets. I think that local volunteering is still very substantially underused. I mean, I'll give you one, exa one example for me. 
uh, in my local diocese, the, ch the church here, I mean, I know that there are very, most of the people who go to church are over the age of 60, but they're actually very motivated people. And there is a, a vast epidemic of loneliness amongst the elderly. Uh, and most large numbers of elderly people in this country spend all day at home, never see anybody. They're just, they're just totally isolated. I've been trying to urge my local bishop, you know, let's organize all the people in the church to go and to become, to befriend, like Peter's done with his <coughs> work, to befriend the, lo the lonely in their homes. And, and I think that actually, and I do think there is a huge res reservoir of altruism in this country that is not fully exploited. Therefore, what for me is missing is leadership. If you have the leaders who can say, right, this is how I'm going to, like Peter's done, this is how I'm going to sh shape the charity. This is what it's going to look like. This, and, how, and my drive is going to make this happen. It doesn't need money. It needs charisma, vision, organizational skills. So I think the, lead, the shortage is leadership, is local leaders to just to take these, find the volunteers and bring them together and solve a problem. Mm -hmm. There actually is no shortage of volunteers. We can get volunteers very easily. And lots of organisations can benefit from that through acts of kindness that a volunteer would give. In our uh, situation, you know, these mothers are dealing with uh, folks from the uh, children's services. They are very limited as to how much the time they can have. And uh, when I sat in on a, a, a training programme in Chicago, uh, we talked about the police and uh, children's services. And, and what a wonderful thing it was that there was police on the street and there were social workers that were coming around to see these mothers that were struggling. Put yourself in the mother's position and she's scared stiff of the police <laughs> and she thinks that the social workers come to take your children away. Yeah. Mm. But the volunteer is there for long periods of yeah. time, acts of kindness, and is there six months, six years, whatever. Uh, we don't have any trouble raising volunteers, but I think what is needed is that you can't manage volunteers with volunteers. You have to pay people to manage volunteers. The health and safety, the risks and everything have to be well looked after these days, the training and everything. Uh, so you have to pay people. We have 65 people working uh, in Safe Families for Children, so we have to find the wages for 65 people. So, and we, we've got old people's works. The, the, the scope for volunteers is incredible. All walks of life whether it's old people, young people, uh, folks with mental health problems, whatever, they can all be helped by a volunteer. But we have to find the way of raising the money. And the local authorities ha haven't got any money to, to pay, uh, you know, the wages of folks that are going to manage the volunteers. For us, we're hoping to develop something that it gets enough scale that the local authority will say, come on, we need to put a little bit of money behind this to scale it up to its full potential. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, sorry, uh, um, I, I absolutely agree there's plenty of uh, volunteers out there. Um, like Peter says, we, we have to advertise, we have to train, we have to um, make sure that they get as much satisfaction out of the job as our employees do. And that, you know, when I say we measure everything, the, the, un the, the unexpected consequence that we had when we thought, well, we'll just measure the volunteers, you know, measuring all the kids, how their confidence, et cetera, has gone up. The, the, un, the, the gold that we hit was the volunteers. When we, we said, how do you feel about yourself? They said, absolutely wonderful. We love, love giving back, and it's nice to be treated properly. And, and that, you know, that is a huge benefit that they, they do get back. And the, just to pick up on uh, quickly two, two little points that the uh, a volunteer working with a troubled child you know the mentoring program we have where we've had thousands of kids go through this program it, it changes the relationship immediately when they say you're doing this as a volunteer mm -hmm. for me you know you're not a you know the fifth social worker I've had you know you mm. just changes the world mm. and somebody somebody mentioned I, I have to mention this because I think old zones are the next thing yeah uh, because a part of our society who has nothing to do, nowhere to go, no one to talk to, 
you know, we have these youth centers, they're doing nothing during the day. Mm. They really aren't. And I am determined that mm. we will get older folk in who are stuck in their homes to come into these wonderful facilities to just, even once a week, you know, it, it changed their lives. What a wonderful idea. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bill. So the, the man at the front there next uh, to I James. I need a mic. It's Kevin Taylor McKnight from the RNLI. I would like to ask a couple of questions, if I may. Um, the first question goes back to something that was touched on earlier, which is about your early days and thinking, <laughs> thinking about. <laughs> Sorry, thinking about your, when you first started your journey, your philanthropic journey, and, and when you first started thinking about giving something back, um, how, th there was a session last week which was, which was about intermediaries and, and their role and how they speak to philanthropists about their giving. So I just wondered um, how much, um, how much would you listen to a professional advisor and how, how much would they have any sway or any impact or any influence whatsoever on, on your giving? Is that something, or all your thoughts about your giving coming from you rather than being influenced by those external people, those external advisors? So that's the, that's the first part of what I'd like to ask. The second part of what I'd like to ask is about recognition. And I noticed that lots of the organizations that you have established and been, and been very much involved in, in establishing, none of them bear your name. In the organization that I work for at the RNLI, clearly recognition, we have a lot of boats and lots of our donors want their name on the side of a boat, which is something <laughs> that happens quite a lot and it's not always straightforward. Um, just thinking about recognition from your point of view, I'd be interested to hear a bit more about how you feel about recognition and what is important to you. So Thank that's you. interesting question, two part. First of all, the role of the guide or the intermediary or the philanthropic advisor how important were they at the start of your philanthropic journey? And um, the second part is about recognition, perhaps having your name on something that you've done. So who'd like to take that on? Um, <laughs> the, the part about intermediaries is really interesting. I think um, we have to recognise the diversity of, of types of donor, actually, both in individual styles and the stages of the journey they're at. So when I started out, I needed lots of help. And I was talking to experts and trying to find advisors. And they were giving me the best advice because in the end, they helped empower me to make the decisions myself. And now I feel much more confident in what I'm doing. Um, but I wanted to get to that point where I could make the decisions independently. Not everyone wants to do that. And there's nothing wrong with being Warren Buffett and saying, I'm just going to give it all to Bill Gates. Yeah. <laughs> that's fine. If that's how you want to do it, as so long as you're giving, I don't mind what model you choose. I think the mistake is when people don't think that there's one right way to do it. And actually, if you don't have time to really get to know the subject, give it to someone else and let them give for you. If you want to make every decision yourself, you've got to skill yourself up. Community foundations are amazing because they give people the confidence to have that advice within a local community and to have help along the way. Um, I'd like to see more people doing donor education. If you're going to make the decisions yourself, you, know, you, you wouldn't enter a new business career and not take an MBA. Um, most donors still think you can do it as a kind of amateur hobby. On recognition, uh, for me, it's never been personally important, but I think a lot of donors start to realise that the most powerful thing they can have isn't just the checkbook, it's voice and advocacy. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's incredibly unfair that I will get invited to come and sit up here and speak on a panel. I don't really deserve that. But if I can talk about the things I care about, then I'm going to use that. So um, becoming an advocate is perhaps more important than the name on a building. Thank you, Fran. Anybody else like to join in there? No. Uh, yeah. uh, what's the name of that um, <laughs> Jewish rabbi? My Omenides? How do you pronounce it? My Omenides? Um, anyway, there was, <laughs> there was a um, Jewish rabbi, a 14th century uh, in Spain, who uh, had a hierarchy of giving. Uh, uh, motives and it, sorry Ruby. well that's not the one I know uh, <laughs> come on James <laughs> what's the name I, I know, I haven't got it. okay uh, yeah yes exactly how is it pronounced okay <laughs> anyway uh, I recommend it if you go, I couldn't possibly spell it but he, I recommend uh, looking it up and um, he has 10 I think it's 10 categories of giving and any the recognition piece is right down at the bottom so as soon as he, he in his view 
any, any, if you sought recognition that devalues the gift. I'm not sure it devalues the gift. Um, and I, I, uh, but um, I think recognition is really valuable for actually for the volunteers and for people. I think we as a society should almost completely skew the entire honors system towards charity. Uh, and uh, forget about rewarding civil servants, forget about rewarding business people, forget about rewarding, maybe sportsmen you can't you just keep in there. But, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but basically volunteers should get just massively rewarded because we, we, we must reward, uh, and it's, it's a way of encouraging people, and we've got as a society to encourage that. So that, that is a way that it's very valuable. And I agree with Fran also that advocacy, advocacy is important. And, I, you know, people who, I think Bill said it's very hard to get anything out of central government. Because I'm in London, I actually have relationships in central government which make it easier for me to get stuff out of central government. Mm -hmm. So that is, whether that's to do with recognition, but at least but knowing people and, and that networks are really, are really valuable. Um, and which, and so I would, and I feel it's really tough for the Northeast because you, it's just harder to have those networks with, with, uh, that's a Brexit issue, uh, with, 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 with the right people in London. That's true. Um, so, you know, that's a wider conversation, I think. Thank you. Um, Bill, did you want to say something? I was just uh, going to say the, um, um, the community uh, foundations, uh, I think are great, you know, in my personal philanthropy. Um, it's, it's quite offensive if you've been in business and you've made money by good rules just to scatter it around willy-nilly because just, you know, it, it, you don't feel that it's being used properly. And the uh, community foundations as a, a network, they come and they, you can give them money for the whole county and they will find the charities and do the due diligence and do the follow-ups make it really easy to do it very effectively. I think it's a fantastic organization. Um, very few of our donors, and we've had you know, a lot, have asked for any recognition at all. Um, it's, it's quite rare, actually, these, these days. Um, and I wonder whether that's about the level of giving, because we've got people who are giving, say, a gift of 50,000, for example. That's the, we get across 52,000 pounds least expensive vote. So I'm thinking about people who are giving at that level and then people who are giving at a transformational level, which is, is quite different. Thank you very much for that. So I'm moving on to this side of the table. Rumi. Thank you. Thank you so much for the uh, fantastic speeches. Uh, I'm Romain Yang. I'm a PhD student at Newcastle University. I've got one question to four speakers. How do you make sure that the charities you set up fit in the local context? How do you make sure the charities you set up fit into the local context? Fran. Um, so today I've spoken about 360 giving, the campaign about grant making, but my foundation actually funds in sub-Saharan Africa. And my general rule of thumb there is not to set up any charities. It's to find charities that exist in a local community and support them because they know the community far better than I ever could. Um, it's to trust the knowledge on the ground, to do due diligence, to check, to check it with experts and advisors, but let the solutions come from those communities. And always do your homework. Mm -hmm. Yeah, always do your homework. Peter? I mean, what we've tried to stress with uh, each of the regions that we've gone to is that it's their region, uh, so it's a solution for Liverpool, it's a solution for Manchester, it's a solution for Southampton, wherever we are. It's, it's their solution for their issues within their town. So the, the volunteers and the uh, supporters that are there uh, are you know, focusing on the local issues. It's not a national charity, although it is. Uh, it's very much made to feel as if it's, it's a Liverpool charity. Yeah, Fran? Sorry, just one other point. If, if you are going into new areas or setting up new things, there are so many places to go for information um, in developing countries or in the UK. And so being data literate, having sources of information, just as you do your due diligence in investment, is saying, you know, these guys know the educational attainment levels in those areas. They know what the number of teachers are. They know what the poverty levels are. They know what the pupil premium. Um, we're in a, an age where there's never been more information 
that you can use to inform your work, um, but you may have to look in many different sources to bring it together. Thank you. Um, I've, we've actually reached the end of our allotted time, but if anybody's got one quick final question, yes, lady at the back there. <laughs> Hello. We're talking about philanthropy today. We're talking about transformational philanthropy. So that, I assume, involves some innovation, risk, and failure. How do you deal with failure and risk to make sure your money is doing the best it can, but is truly transformational? That's a very important question, which we haven't touched on. How do we deal with failure? Would anybody like to take it on? Well, we learn by it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we, we learn more, as the famous saying goes, by our failures. And, you know, we, we were starting with a blank sheet of paper, really. And um, it's like anything. If you have a business in the early days, you want them to try everything um, and see what works the very best. And then you refine it down to what you do uh, best and is the most su successful. We, you know, we've had 10 years and we're still learning but um, you it, it is important but you put it right you learn by it and then we put it out uh, through through the network yeah. we're not a, we're not afraid of taking risks this is really important we want to try things and if it doesn't work great but at least we try somebody else brought that up and you know it's a really important to take risks we're becoming risk averse which is bonkers Well, dealing with young people's lives, you know, I mean, we're, you have to be really, really careful. We don't take risks with, you know, we don't sort of electrocute people just to see what happens, you know. <laughs> it, 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 um, it's, it's in a very tightly um, controlled area, but we will try new things all, all, all the time. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I mean, obviously, we we're, we're have a foundation and we give lots of grants to all sorts of folks. And we can't guarantee that they all will win. I mean, Fran is part of a much bigger organisation than the rest of us all put together. Uh, and I'm sure they make hundreds of thousands of grants. And you try and do your best to make sure that you've done your due diligence. But at the end of the day, you know, you leave it to the folks who we've given the money to. If we're doing it ourselves, obviously, it's a whole different ball game. You, you know, you have to use all your experience and your... your your wisdom and the wisdom of others to make sure that what we've got is rock solid and, and will not fail, as Bill said. You know, he's going to stand by the youth zone so none of them fail. And, uh, you know, that's how we are. We, we build businesses and uh, used all the due diligence necessary. Um, oh, Paul, quick. <laughs> um, just this, uh, I, I completely agree this point about we, we have to take risks and we have to be willing to fail. And I was very mar and, I, and I think we should apply pretty much the same intellectual rigor uh, as one does in business. I was very marked in, in my investing career by the, Hoffman LaRoche had a very famous CEO in the 1980s called Henry Meyer. And I remember him saying that in the R&D pipeline for their drug development, he transformed the business, and he said the key thing he did to transform the business was introducing intellectual cruelty. He had all of these scientists who were very, very attached to their particular science and their particular drug development, and he came and said, well, you know, how long has this been in the pipeline? 15 years. How much have you spent? You know, so certain things he had to cut. He cut, and maybe he threw some, a couple of things, babies out with the bathwater, but basically you need the willingness to be quite ruthless. And in ARC, we have something called ARC Ventures, where we develop these new ideas. And quite a few of them, actually, most of them do bear fruition, but some don't. And we have one, for example, last year, we, we've been, we tried to basically develop a way of taking out all of the technology, the, in, the in, IT infrastructure for, for the whole school network uh, and do it a lot better so that we could provide a solution to all the schools um, and it, didn't, it hasn't gone well. Uh, it hasn't, it's, it's been too complex, the execution has been faulty, 
and we've had a big internal debate and we're basically we're giving them six months and if they don't either find a buyer or a solution we'll close it down uh, and that will be a lot of money that we've spent which we wanted to create something a not-for-profit um, solution to the school system and we would failed uh, but the, what you've got to be able to do is just to say this isn't working no more money Fran. Um, I think all of us on the panel are aligned with the idea of risk-taking for philanthropy. Everything that's got an evidence base now was innovative once and somebody had to try it. But we're still quite bad at talking about failure. And sometimes that's for good reasons. We don't want to stigmatise a charity if something that's gone wrong that wasn't their fault. But also we don't like to admit that we failed. So a colleague at a large foundation that will remain nameless uh, asked their research department what their impact was like. And the research head said, it's great. Every project we've ever funded has succeeded. And, and he fired the research department. Um, <laughs> it just doesn't happen like that. We are very bad judges of our own success or failure. And so that's one of the reasons I want philanthropy to open up, because we shouldn't be the judges. Mm. It's really hard for charities to tell a donor that the donor is making a bad decision because in the end we've still got the checkbook. They're not incentivized to tell us the truth. So the more we can open up, the more that academics, researchers, journalists, other charities, other donors, can hold us to account and help us to learn by pointing out where we've failed or succeeded. Thank you very much. Well, it falls to me now to draw things to a close, and I'd like to thank the panel for their brilliant presentations and contributions. And, you know, we started today talking about transformational philanthropy, but I think that the stories we've heard have not just been about transformational philanthropy, but about truly inspirational philanthropy. And I think they've, they've given us, at a time I think we all need it, quite a lot of hope. So thank you very much for that. And um, I hope you'll join me with thanking them.